おかげですふまきらベープマットパルクに帰るとこんなに綺麗だったっけ今度これ着ようかな
this was something special. This was gargoyles. But what made it so special? That's what we're here to find out. And what better place to start with than the actual premise of the show? Let's find out as I take my hat off to Gargoyles. Gargoyles takes place in a world where the stone statues we're all familiar with aren't just decoration. At night, they break out of their stone shell and serve humanity as defenders of the night. And the main group of gargoyles we follow is a clan that protects a castle in Scotland, led by the mighty Goliath. Other characters include his mentor, his lady love and second in command, and three young gargoyles that follow him, among many other gargoyles in his clan. Goliath is actually the only one with a name, as most gargoyles in his clan don't take them, which I think would get confusing. I mean, you can only go, hey bud, before it starts to get old, but I have my customs and they have theirs. It's not like I expect them to perform a sacrifice every blood moon. We all have our things. But Goliath and his gargoyles defend the castle, even if the humans that live there are a little less than grateful, barring the captain of the guards who regards Goliath as a friend. However, one day, while Goliath is out, the castle is sacked and the gargoyles are broken during the day wiping out the entire clan, save those aforementioned few that were hiding out down below and the exes they were watching. This was actually a betrayal from the captain of the guards who didn't like the way the princess ran things, so he decided to try and change things for himself by teaming up with the invaders. The main invader and the captain end up fighting and falling to their deaths, sparing them from Goliath's wrath. I've been denied everything, even my revenge! While, after a misunderstanding, the remaining gargoyles are turned to stone permanently by the princess and her court magician. Realizing that they have made a mistake, they agree to turn Goliath to stone as well, and the condition for their spell to be broken would be for the castle that they guarded to reach above the clouds and Goliath decided that he wanted to see if one day they could all be free again. The princess and magician agree to guard over the eggs, and the gargoyles sleep for over a thousand years, where amazingly, a man named Xanatos has actually managed to raise the castle above the sky, bringing it to New York in the process, and awaking the gargoyles, who are both afraid and fascinated in this brand new era. While initially seeming friendly, the gargoyles soon learn that he's actually a criminal mastermind who wants to use the gargoyles in his schemes, even recruiting Goliath's once thought lost mate to his team who now calls herself Demona and harbors a hatred of humans for what they did to her clan. The gargoyles allies themselves with a detective named Elisa Mazda and with her as their link to this brand new world, they become unsung heroes of the night once again. Right away from this first season, you get a good look at what makes this show stand out. You have all these characters, each driven by very different, yet intersecting means. And you get to see how the world draws them together, and how they manage to either come together, or fight for what they believe in. And the characters are great. Of course, we have the leader Goliath, who is an amazing character in an already strong lineup. He's chivalrous, kind, and caring, but if anyone hurts his family or the weak, he'll instantly become a force you wouldn't want to mess with. A lot of his personality and likability comes from the phenomenal performance of voice acting legend Keith David, who gives Goliath his signature booming voice that makes him sound both intimidating and warlike, but at the same time intelligent and respectful. Stone at night. What sorcery is this? You get a lot of that in how he spends his time as well. Whenever he's not out fighting the good fight, you'll usually catch him reading. Like he's not just some beast, he's incredibly smart, and the way he carries himself when dealing with people is almost high class. The way he folds his wings over his shoulder like a cloak, which is a great visual touch that transforms him from savage to suave in an instant. 
but he isn't the only gargoyle that guards New York now. You have his mentor, who now goes by the name Hudson, taken from the river of the same name. He was the leader of the clan before Goliath, and now he serves as a sort of paternal figure to the rest of the gargoyles. A lot of his storylines deal with him aging and having to deal with the fact that he's not as strong as he used to be. But what he lacks in strength, he makes up for in wisdom, often serving as a tactician of the team, drawing upon his years of wisdom. He also quickly grows fond of the TV, and spends a lot of his time guarding the clock tower that they live in now, with the clan's resident gargoyle beast, Bronx, who isn't just a weird gargoyle. Weissman actually confirmed that gargoyles are a whole genus, and that Bronx and the rest of the gargoyles are actually kind of like comparing humans and monkeys, though Bronx's behavior more closely resembles a dog. There's actually a whole lot of cool gargoyle facts that Weissman confirmed, like the reason that their clothes turned to stone with them is that Caesar Augustus had a spell of humility cast upon them. People were tired of gargoyles waking up and becoming naked on the spot. Nikki is good! Nikki is free! Nikki is... Nikki! But I'm just saying, if it was Demona, I wouldn't mind that much. But anyway, Bronx kinda acts like the dog of the group. You also have the main young gargoyle trio, now going by Lexington, Broadway, and Brooklyn. Lexington is the most curious of the group, and quickly learns about and masters the technology of the new world. Broadway is the strongest and most hungry of the group, but he's also the kindest and most empathetic of the three. And Brooklyn is the wild card of the group. He can be impulsive and sarcastic, but when he puts his mind to it, he shows that he has the qualities of a future leader, even if he's not sure he wants to lead himself. These three share a strong brother-like bond, and they make up for each other's weaknesses really well. You get to see a lot of the city through them, and as they explore and make new friends, and new enemies. Leading to the main destructive force of the show, David Xanatos. You know the answer to that, Owen. Pay a man enough, and he'll walk barefoot into hell. Xanatos is... well, Xanatos is a legend. Not only is he a magnificent bastard, he's THE magnificent bastard. Always 10 steps ahead, he has plans for his plans, and regardless of what happens, he ALWAYS finds a way to end up on top. He is the main antagonist of the show, and he is just so darn good at it. With his voice actor, Jonathan Frakes, almost giving Keith David a run for his money, Xanatos. It's nice to see you too, Goliath. And if that voice sounds familiar, he played Commander Riker on Star Trek. But more importantly, he's this guy. It's false. No way. Not this time. We created it. Not this time. No. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's weird, but he's not the only Star Trek alumni in this show. LeVar Burden, Michael Dorn, and many, many others had a role in some way or form in Gargoyles. Later, Weissman would remark that they had never planned for this to happen, but once they had cast Franks and Marina Sirtis, everyone started thinking about what other Star Trek people they could get to fill the roles. But Xanatos was an amazing character, whether he was acting as a friend or foe to the Gargoyles. I preferred foe, but he wasn't the only human the Gargoyles were close to. We also have Elisa Mazda, a surprisingly non-white, non-male cop, who often teamed up with the Gargoyles in an effort to keep the city safe. Yep, while Disney was experimenting with theming an audience, they were also trying to take a step towards representation. And you don't get more inclusive than a half-black, half-Native American policewoman. And she was a great character, always on the case, no nonsense, but laid back enough to roll with the punches and take a joke. Happy Halloween. I can't get through a shift this month without mopping up after that thing. Yeah, every night's trick-or-treat in the Big Apple. She made a great foil to the often kinda stiff Goliath, getting him to come out of his stone shell and learn to trust humans again. And when it came to her, maybe a bit more than trust. There were always hints of romance between the two, which I get because look at them, they're both hot, but also they're both kind of kindred spirits. 
people who want to protect those around them and need someone to confide in. I don't even know if Elisa even has that many friends. During the show, you mostly just see her with family or co-workers. By meeting the gargoyles, she finds a group of people she can talk to. And in turn, the gargoyles find someone who can help them make their way in this brand new world. But with this brand new love interest, also came the wrath of Demona, Goliath's former love, now turned vengeful human hater. Which, same, Demona is a very interesting character, fueled by rage and the fact that she thinks humans are the cause of all her problems, when in reality, it's her own hate and fear that causes most of her suffering. She actually had conspired with the captain of the guards to overthrow their castle, because she was sick of the way the gargoyles were treated. And because of her actions, she lost her clan. But she doesn't want to take responsibility. And so she blames humanity. She also serves as one of the main antagonistic forces on the show. Using her mastery of magic and science to cause havoc and try and reclaim the world for gargoyles. These are the characters that make up the main cast of gargoyles. And to be honest... It really comes together. Everything that happens changes the characters, and the status quo is always in shift. Characters grow into their roles, the younger gargoyles take more responsibility and learn more about modern times, while Goliath learns that regardless of the time period, or the people's perception of him, he still wants to fight for what's right. Xanatos is more than just a maniacal villain, and sometimes he even ends up on the gargoyle's side, as long as there's something to gain for him. I want to be your friend. There is much we can do for each other, Goliath. Even Demona shows signs that she might not be past redemption, and all of these characters and themes were held up by a very high production. The painted backgrounds, lighting, and strong character designs made this show easy to get lost in. The moody tone of the city blending perfectly with the imposing figures of the gargoyles. Plus the fact that the gargoyles are only awake during the night gives the show a perfect excuse to primarily take place at night. And the music in this show is phenomenal. Not just the amazing opening theme, but the soundtrack during the show. The flutes adding an air of mystery to some scenes and playfulness to some others. The soundtrack really gives this show an identity of its own, considering not a lot of other shows sound like this. All of these things add up to a smash hit, and Disney was very impressed. Ordering not another 13 episode season, but a 52 episode one. Eisner was now completely on board, and he wanted the strike while the iron was hot. He wanted toy deals, VHS tapes, he even wanted to use Gargoyles as the starting point for a brand new action-oriented universe for Disney. Yep, before Disney bought Marvel, they wanted to compete with them, and Gargoyles was their way in. Now, this all sounds well and good. I mean, who wouldn't want their show to be successful? But this led to a few problems. The team making Gargoyles was too small to support 52 episodes in the schedule that Disney wanted, and so it had to increase to over four times the size. People had to learn how to make gargoyles, and they had to do it quick. They needed more studios to handle the animation, and they had to use their budgets a bit more sparingly. It's a big part of the reason why you hear a lot of the same sound effects, and why the episodes all started with recaps. Gotta save money where you can. But this didn't deter the team, because there was still a lot to come. And we'll get into that after this break. Alright, so I've gone over a lot of the main characters, but that only gets you so far in a show like this. 
You can only fight Xanatos and Demona so many times before you start to get sick of them, attractive as they may be. So Gargoyles had to add a few more faces to the mix, especially with that huge new episode order. So we got a nice little rogue gallery to tangle with the Gargoyles, and even a few more side characters as well. Some of my favorites were The Pack, a TV action group that moonlighted as criminals on the side. My favorite of them was Hyena, for obvious reasons. But they were a force to be reckoned with, especially after they later all augmented themselves, turning into a group of mutants and cyborgs. We also had Dr. Anton Severius, played by a very into it Tim Curry. Like, he talks like every word is drenched in syrup. I love it. Oh, I get it. We're being watched. Is that it? Very well. Yes! I betrayed you. You robbed me of my greatest creation. He's a crazy biologist who loves nothing more than to tamper with nature, trying to recreate gargoyles through his own means. He even ends up mutating Elisa's brother into a hybrid gargoyle-like creature. And he even makes a clone of Goliath that is a mix of Goliath and Xanatos. It was the 90s. We ate up stuff like this. Of course, both the pack and Severius were both puppets of Xanatos, especially the pack, considering that its leader, Fox, would later go on to become his wife, as well as the only person that he considers his equal. But it wasn't just bad guys added to the cast. We also have Elisa's partner, Bluestone, a pretty good cop who has an eye for conspiracy theories, trying to track down the Illuminati. He later becomes another friend to the Gargoyles, while also giving Elisa someone to confide in. We even later learned that the Gargoyles aren't the only ones left of their clan, as the Princess and Court Magician have been raising the eggs they left in the past on a mystical island called Avalon, where time passes much slower, leading to the discovery of Angela, a young female Gargoyle who also happens to be the daughter of Goliath and more concerningly, Demona. Angela was a great addition to the cast, bringing in a new female member, along with hammering in some themes of family and maturing, with her mostly having grown up sheltered away from the world. Plus, it shows that there are still gargoyles all over the world, which we learn during an arc where Goliath, Eliza, and Angela travel around the world, coming across different types of gargoyles, along with various other creatures of legend and folktales. Greek gods, Norse gods, African myths, and Celtic deities, if you can name it, it was in Gargoyles, and it really lent itself to the world building. By building such a strong framework on top of an already existing myth and stories people are already familiar with, you got an instant sense of recognition, along with a chance to reinvent the wheel. People know who King Arthur is, but do they know how he would factor into the world of Gargoyles? No, and that's what makes it so interesting seeing how these myths fit in. Even Shakespeare characters played a huge part in the story. Macbeth is a character who starts off as what we believe to be a type of gargoyle hunter, but it's later revealed that he's connected to Demona in a bond of immortality, linking them so that neither can die unless killed by each other. Macbeth turns from a ruthless killer to a very sympathetic character, and we also get to see Demona's tragic past, and how she's been alone for so long, warping her even further. It's some really compelling stuff, and it's really cool seeing all the pieces fall into play. Everything that happens in Gargoyles matters, and they constantly remind you that it matters. With much deeper stories than you would expect from a Disney show, especially of that time. There's an episode where Broadway is messing around with Elisa's gun, and he accidentally shoots her, which not only shows a powerful message, but it changes Broadway permanently. He develops a permanent hatred for guns, and becomes a fierce rival to Dracon, a local mobster who runs a weapons racket. And after Elisa is shot, she isn't immediately better. For the next few episodes, you see her limping or in crutches. If something happens in Gargoyles, it happens for a reason. Even Xanatos' assistant is revealed to be a much more important character that was led on, and his reveal is one of my favorite moments of the show. Because when you look at it, it makes sense. You get to experience so much with these characters on their journey, 
and you really grow to love them. I couldn't find one I didn't at least like. There's so many characters I haven't even talked about yet. Fox's father, Renard, the English Gargoyles, the Guardian of the Eggs. But there really is too much to cover, and I implore you to watch it for yourselves. However, just when the show was starting to reach its peak, that's when things started to go wrong for it. Alright, so there were a lot of things that went wrong for Gargoyles. One, there were changes being made in Disney itself. With the death of Frank Wells, the president of Disney at the time, and the building animosity between Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, which led Katzenberg to leave and create DreamWorks. Some of the people that Katzenberg took with him were also some of Gargoyle's biggest supporters. And when they left, all of the things that they were planning around Gargoyles seemed a lot less feasible. And there was a lot planned. Not just counting the universe they wanted to build around Gargoyles. They had six proposed spin-offs in the work. Time Dancer, which would have focused on Brooklyn traveling through time. Bad Guys, which would have shown former villains working to redeem themselves. Think something like Suicide Squad. Gargoyles 2198, a show that would have featured the descendants of Goliath in the clan, even including a reformed Demona. Gargoyles The Dark Ages, which was a prequel series focused on the gargoyles before they were frozen in stone. Pendragon, a series that would have focused on King Arthur teaming up with one of the British gargoyles. And finally, New Olympians, which would have focused on the group of the same name that Goliath and the others had met during their travels. Which, speaking of their travels, that's one of the things that hurt them a lot. The Gargoyles kind of had a berserk moment where they really couldn't get off of this boat and it took them all over the world. I really liked this arc, but I have to admit, not every episode in it was the best and it felt like it was lasting forever and what really didn't happen was the fact that this was happening at the exact same time. The Juice himself. Heisman Trophy winner, NBC sportscaster, and football Hall of Famer O.J. Simpson. Coverage of the O.J. Simpson case as the week continues. Well, O.J. Simpson was back in court this afternoon where he was overheard talking about his jail cell. Prosecutors also told the court reports that a bloody ski mask was found in Simpson's home were wrong. Yep, this arc happened during the O.J. Simpson trial which led to episodes getting moved around for months, leading to the arc feeling even longer. So yeah, you can add gargoyles to the list of things that OJ probably had a hand in killing. Wait, can I say that? Anyway, yeah, all that led to gargoyles switching things up a bit. The next season would only be 13 episodes long, and because Disney had just bought ABC, and switch from syndication to airing on broadcast stations, different rules had to be applied to the standards and practices. Up till this point, Gargoyles had been getting away with a lot. Blood, darker themes, they even fought Nazis at one point, and they said the word Nazi instead of dancing around it. It must be another of those blasted Nazis. But with all these changes, not to mention the fact that after the first episode of the third season started airing, Greg Weissman and his whole team were dropped from the show. It's no wonder why this season, named The Goliath Chronicles, was less than a success. The Goliath Chronicles wasn't terrible, but it had definitely lost a lot of the magic. Gone were the dramatic scenes and the darker tones of the original. Instead, we got storylines like Goliath in Court, or Broadway becoming a TV star. They even nerfed Xanatos and made him into basically the Gargoyles' new best friend. All of this coupled with the fact that they changed animation studios to Nelvana, which gave the show an overall choppy look, led to the show's cancelization after the third season had ran its course. I mean, at least we got this walk out of Elisa, but man, I wish it had gone out on better terms. For a while, it seemed like Gargoyles was on top of the world. The characters appeared at the theme parks, it had toys, video games, 
and was almost the center point of what could have been a brand new direction for Disney itself. But circumstances and forces beyond the control of the team led to its downfall. But the mark it left was not forgotten. To this day, Gargoyles has a small but loyal fan following. There was even a fan-led convention, Gathering of the Gargoyles, which lasted from 1997 to 2009 and featured guests like Keith David and Weissman, where he showed off the plans he had had for some of the Gargoyle spin-offs. And for a while, the show even continued on in the form of a comic, which acted as if the third season had never existed. The comic had some great art and carried on with the same dark themes while also expanding on the characters. They explored Goliath and Elisa's relationship and the fact that Elisa wanted children and how that might stop them from being together. They showed Angela maturing into her relationship with Broadway, even adopting clothes similar to Demona, and they even went deeper into Lexington, who was going to be revealed to be gay and start a relationship with another male gargoyle. They also managed to incorporate some elements of the failed spin-offs into comic books realizing some of the plans they had once had. And although the comic has since stopped publication, Weissman still has hopes of continuing the story one day. And fans of the show haven't forgotten. I mean, even in the finale of the new DuckTales, they dropped in a Gargoyles easter egg that made me scream at 9am. Seriously, you guys, you don't know what this did to me. But regardless of its rocky history, its missteps, and its missed opportunities, Gargoyles is a treasure. And I'm really glad I revisited it. You just don't get TV shows like this anymore. With this mood, this feel, and I would love to see it return one day. But for now, the Gargoyles are back to sleep. But... With the fan community still strong and nostalgia at an all-time high, I have a lot of faith that one day, maybe soon, the Gargoyles will live again. Also, they had a group that was basically the Gargoyles KKK, and I think that was taking the metaphor a bit too far.